Okay, if I might have your attention. Today you're going to build a two-stage amplifier. Are we okay there? Okay. And the structure of the amplifier is something like this. Uh, my glasses, my glasses. Did I bring them? Ah. Yes. I should keep a pair of glasses here, <laughs> standby. Forgot to bring my main glasses, so I got to wear these. These are reading glasses, if you're wondering why I put them down. Because from for the distance, I got to look like this. But to read, I have to put these glasses this way. All right? OK, so um, we have an amplifier that looks something like this. RB1, RB2. This is transistor T1. And this is RE1. And then this is a RC1. Or just let's call it RC. And then the output of this transistor goes to the next stage, which is not capacitor coupled. RE2. There's no collector resistance. Notice that this is a PNP transistor. So here is your emitter number two. Here is your collector. And here is your base for this transistor. And then these are capacitor coupled. And here is your output voltage V0. And here is your input voltage, again, capacitor coupled. Vn. Okay. So this is the amplifier. This is a two-stage amplifier. This is the first stage here. And let's call this as um, V out 1. And so the gain V out 1 to V in is essentially minus RC over RE as you did in the previous lab. If you do it under the right conditions, RC divided by RE with a minus sign is the gain from here to here. This stage here is the emitter follower, or the common uh, emitter circuit. And the gain of this stage is 1, because notice that this is the base, this is the emitter. And the emitter voltage and base voltage are only 0.7 volts apart, which is a DC voltage. And as a result, any change here is going to be the same change here, because it's a constant voltage apart. So this is going to be a unity gain amplifier. And this is going to be an amplifier with gain RC over RE. <coughs> Why are we doing two stages? Uh, it's We are doing two stages because one of the nice things about this second amplifier is that the current here can be beta times larger, or 1 plus beta times larger than the current here. And so this loading, this transistor, has reduces the loading of the output load on this transistor circuit. For example, if I connected a loudspeaker here or a headphone, a headphone impedance is probably somewhere around 2K. You know these headphones that you have or your earbuds? If I connected a 2K resistance directly here, it would load this amplifier. If I connected it here, you might have a current flowing here, but the current flowing into the base is much smaller than the current you're feeding into the output. So even though you're getting unity gain, you're not loading this part of the circuit. So this kind of a final stage, which has an emitter follower or common collector transistor circuit, is quite widely used. And it buffers. Remember we did the unity gain buffer with the op amp? So this stage buffers the load from the actual amplifier. So the amplifier doesn't see that load, sees a much reduced load, a load which is 1 plus beta times smaller. Because the current, of course, escaping here is 1 plus beta times the current flowing in the collector. So that's the reason why you have a two-stage amplifier. And now you're required to design it. There are certain things that are given to you. And the first thing that is given to you is that uh, 
Um, the uh, VCC is 10 volts. The battery voltage is given. This is 10 volts. And these capacitors are given to you. These are 100 nanofarad. How do we handle the 100 nanofarad? We just assume that they are small and they are large enough so that as far as the signal is concerned, they are a short circuit. So for the signal circuit, we shall treat them as a short circuit. Now, of course, we could have made this a two-stage amplifier and put a capacitor here too to isolate these two stages, but we are doing what is called direct coupled amplifier here. We, we don't have another capacitance stage there. So we're directly coupling this amplifier stage to this amplifier stage without an intermediate capacitor. And not having an intermediate capacitor is a good thing because although we assume that the capacitor is a short circuit, in reality at low frequencies it's not. So direct couple amplifiers like this behave much nicer at low frequencies. OK, now let's start designing it. We want the voltage gain of this circuit to be somewhere in the range 4 to 6. So we want the gain, voltage gain to be approximately 5, but we don't mind a bit of difference. Why do you think I put an absolute value there? Yes? Correct. The first stage inverts it, the second stage doesn't. So the overall gain of this amplifier is a negative gain, but we are giving, we are saying that the magnitude of the gain is between 4 and 6, that means the gain is between minus 4 and minus 6. We are also given that we want, this is all given, we want IC1 to be equal to approximately 1 milliamp. So we want the current in this stage here to be approximately 1 milliamp and the current in this stage, second stage here to be approximately 2 milliamps. Let's call it IE2. So this is also given to us. We want also, now here is something that we want. We want the input resistance seen by this source to be greater than 10K. And what else do we want? I think that's all we want. And this last thing is you must use resistor values from the table provided. You can't make up any resistor value that you want. So that means that you have to play around a bit so that your answers are within this. You can select your resistor values from this table given. The reason for selecting from the table is obvious. When you build this circuit, you want your parts to be available from a bin. And maybe your company has only bought a certain set of components. And you have to find the resistor values from there. When I describe how to do this design, I'm going to describe it without worrying about this aspect. Because I'm going to show you the basic principles. And it's your job to play around a little bit so that the values coincide with the values that you have in the box. Then that's why you have some range here, like in the range 4 to 6. Okay. So let's start this design. Now I'll just st start you. So first, let's start with the second stage. We are required to have the voltage VE2, let's call this 2 here, because this could be C1, V, E1, and B1. Notice that this is C1, but this is E2, because this is PNP, it's inverted, and you can see the emitter is there. So we want VE2 to be somewhere in the range of 4. Point, uh, four to 5.6 volts. Now, why are we selecting this range here? You remember that uh, all our amplification is there will be an offset voltage, and the amplification will be around that offset voltage. If we wanted maximum swing, we should select the voltage accordingly. Now, let's see what the maximum swing available to us at the output is. All right, so when this transistor is cut off, what is the voltage VE2 equal to? Cutoff meaning it's, remember, there are two sides to the active region. At one extreme end, you're very close to cutoff. At the other extreme end, you're very close to saturation. Okay? So when you're very close to cutoff, 
or you say you're practically cut off, what is the voltage at the point? We, what, is the, what are the currents in this transistor when it's cut off? Zero. zero. Last problem on the quiz. So when the currents are zero, the voltage VE2 is going to be equal to how much volts? Cut off meaning no current flowing. 10 volts because there is no current in the resistor, so no voltage drop. And this is the cutoff. And when uh, VE2, when the transistor is very, very close to saturation, what is the voltage drop here across this? 0.2 volts. Because both junctions are now close to forward bias, this junction is 0.7, this junction is 0.5. And so VE2 is very, very close to 0.2 volts, or so practically 0 volts, at the other edge of the active region. So anywhere between 0.2 volts and 10 volts, this transistor is active. So anywhere between 0.2 volts and 10 volts, the transistor is active. So my question to you is, what should my bias point be here? That means without the signal being present, where should I position myself? Anybody got any comments? Yes? And the reason being, the answer seems to be probably around 5. And the reason is? On either side, right? So you see, this is what it means. When I use this as an amplifier, if I'm biased at around 5 volts, then I have about 5 volts to move in that direction and 5 volts to move in that direction, assuming 0.2 is very close to 0. So I have roughly equal space to move in both directions. If I bias myself too close to 10 volts, then I, I can swing a lot in the negative direction. But if I have a symmetric voltage swing, I can only swing that much. Because beyond that, I will get a clipping. And I will no longer be able to saturate. Although in this direction, I can go as far as I want, but, or much further. But I will clip there. So therefore, that's not a good idea to be positioned. right? It's like when you're a goalkeeper in a soccer game, the soccer goalpost is like this, if you've ever seen it. And here's the goalkeeper. Where should he stand? Should he stand in the middle of the goalpost, or should he stand on either side? Middle, because then he can jump this way, or he can jump this way. He's equidistant from both sides, and stop the goal from happening. Right? Actually, if you have <laughs> in a real game, Goalkeeper never stands in the middle. But that's another story. <laughs> it turns out you just have to guess that the ball's going to be coming in this direction and move there. Okay? Otherwise, you can never jump. But we're not talking about soccer. But common sense tells us he should stand in the middle. Okay? Uh, so it's the same way if you're driving on a one-way road. You're li legally allowed to drive. Uh, this is one dotted line. This is the other dotted line. Should you drive your car in the middle of the lane, or should you drive it to one extreme end? So one wheel is one inch away from the uh, dotted line, uh, or should you drive over here? Right? What's the answer? Probably in the middle, because you, know, you want to have maximum clearance from si cars on this side, as well as cars on this side. If you come too close to this side, yeah, you've got plenty of room with cars from this side, but you don't have any room for cars on that lane. Right? So you always stay in the middle. And that's the reason why you bias yourself in the middle. And that is why we are told to bias ourselves in the range 4.2 to 5.6. Why not exactly 5 or 5.1 if you want to be very, very precise? Uh, yes, but also because we got to choose values of from out of a box. And so when we choose things from out of a box, our answers may not come perfectly. And so we have some leeway to, that we can, you know, but approximately 5 volts is the range. So, and we are also given that the current has to be approximately 2 milliamps. So I'm going to assume that the current is 2 milliamps. So let me choose. IE2 as exactly 2 milliamps, and VC as exactly 5 volts. Because I'm asked to choose something between 5.6 and 4.4, uh, uh, so I'm going to choose 5. Now, already I know this is not a good answer. 
because this gives me, this will give me a resistor value which is not from the box. Indeed, if I make 2 milliamps as my bias current here in the absence of the signal, that means when we don't connect V in, then if I connect 2 milliamps here and I see 5 volts here, then immediately RE2 will come out to be, what will come out, will it come out to be? It will be 10 volts minus 5 volts divided by 2 milliamps and that gives me 5K. 5K isn't in the box. All right? But I'm not constraining myself to select stuff out of the box. That is for you. All right? Because I'm not going to constrain myself. It's too hard. I'm not used to doing funny numbers. All right? But uh, you guys can play around with this current. You can change it from 2 milliamps. You can change that for 5 milliamps. So what you get here is going to be something out of the box. OK? Can you do that? Can you play around a little bit? That's what you have to do. This is design. Right? I'm not going to do it, of course, because I'm not doing design here. I'm just telling you what the procedure is. You, but you will have to play around with these numbers. Maybe you have to use 5 point something else. And so you get 4 point. A good value is to use 4.7K, I would think. If I use this as 4.7K, then that 5 volts should be something else. Hopefully, it would be still in the range. Yes? Oh, this is 2.5K. That is not in the box. 2.5K is not in the box. OK. All right. So you can select numbers that are closer to the box. But I'm going to just start with RE2. Now, once I know RE2, I'm, uh, now I have this amplifier here. What should I choose as my voltage for VO1? Because now I want to do the rest of these designs. OK, I've got 1 milliamp flowing here, because that's given to me that this, is, this current is 2 milliamps approximately. And this current is approximately 1 milliamp. Let me choose 1 milliamp, because I'm not constrained by choosing things out of a box, like you are. So if I choose 1 milliamp there, what voltage should I choose at the collector? What is the range of that voltage? from the edge of saturation to cut off. When the transistor is cut off, what is this voltage going to be? Ignore that stage for now. When this is the transistor is cut off and no currents are flowing, what's the voltage VC1 going to be? 10 volts. When the transistor is just on the verge of saturation, what are we going to find? When we're on the verge of saturation, we're going to have RC1 and RE. And there's going to be a 0.2 volt voltage here. And the currents are approximately going to be the same because IC is equal to RE in active region. And although we are, act, we are, not, we are, we are still active, we are on the verge of saturation of 0.2. Some people take it as 0.3, but I'm not going to worry about that. They say saturation is 0.2 and verge of saturation is 0.3. But let's say it's 0.2 or 0.3. But compared to 10 volts, it's practically 0, right? So I'll ignore that. I'll just take it as 0. 0.3 volts in comparison to 10, no big deal. So I'm going to have this. So you can see that at this point, the voltage will be RE over RC. Sorry, RE, RE plus RC. It will be a voltage divider between 10 volts and RE. Now this will be a very small number because uh, remember that the gain of this stage, the gain of this stage is RC over RE. V0 will be 1 divided by Vn is minus RC over RE. And this number is somewhere in the range of 5. So that means that RE over RE plus RC is somewhere in the range of 1 sixth. And so it will be 1 sixth of 10 volts, which is about 1.8 volts or so. Right? So I'm going to be 1.8 volts at one extreme, 10 volts at the other extreme. What should I choose as my middle voltage? One end is 1.6, the other end is 10. Where should I be? Quick. Somebody work it out. What's the average of 1.6 and 10? Five point eight. So keep this somewhere around five or six volts. Because five is close to five point eight, six is close to five point eight. Something like that, you can keep that voltage. All right? So you now can, but you, uh, there's a little bit of design here. 
So let me just keep VC as 5 volts. That, that's easy for me. You can keep it 6. 6 is closer to that average, but I'm not going to worry about it because I'm going to be in a window. Because uh, you, know, you, you can be flexible. This is a design. So if I choose VC 1 equal to 5 volts, that means that RC is going to be 10 volts minus 5 volts divided by 1 milliamp which is going to be equal to 5 kilo ohms, which is also a number not out of the box. So you will have to play around what with this voltage till you get a number, and maybe even with the 1 milliamp, because it says that you have to have that current approximately 1 milliamp. So if it's 0.9 or something, so that you get a nice number out of the box, that is something that you have to do. And once you know what RC is, then RE1 is equal to gain because gain is RC over RE. So RE is RC over gain. So that's what it will be. And then gain you can select in the range 4 to 6. RC you have already selected. And so make RE1 come out to be a nice number. So that's how you design RE. So we have designed RE2, RC, RE1. Now we have to design RB1 and RB2. I'm going to erase this now. One of the conditions that you have your circuit to be working is that the this, now, now here you have a little bit of juggling to do, maybe. And that is that you have to have this current here much bigger than the current entering the base. You knew how to bias it. You've done it twice before, the last two labs were involved with this. You've got to make sure your current entering here, IB, is much smaller than the current there. The current here is 1 milliamp, so the current entering here is 1 milliamp divided by beta. What is beta? What's beta? You've got to look up the characteristics of your curve. Is it given? Sorry? Oh, how do you know 150? All right, what you have to do is to take the smallest beta. Because remember, there's a range of betas. You want, you want the current I, let's call it as I1 or IB1, to be much greater than beta uh, uh, or IE over beta. All right? Because this current is IC over beta. This is IB. IC is given to us as 1 milliamp. So if I want this equation to be true, what value of beta should I use? The smallest or the largest? The largest or the smallest? Uh, let me ask you a simple question. You're required to design a, say you're a civil engineer and you're required to design a bridge that will take a, ton, a, a load of one ton, OK? So should you decide it for 1.001 ton or 2 tons? Well, they said that design it so it takes 1 ton, so why not do 1.001? Well, you want a safety margin of some sort, right? So, what, so suppose I say to you that the, the weight on this bridge will be anywhere between 1 and 2 tons. Should you design the bridge for 1 ton or should you design it for 2 tons? Why? Because if you're optimistic and you say, ah, they told me one to two tons, why don't I assume that all trucks going over this will be exactly one ton? I'll design it so it handles one ton. Well, then the two ton truck comes and then you're lost. All right? So if you design it for the smallest beta, the smallest beta will give me the largest value of this number. And if I make this l much larger than that, then I'm really safe because I'm much larger than the largest number I can expect. So always use the smallest beta there. OK, so that's something that you have to consider. And so look at the characteristic of your transistor. Look at the typical range of beta, and then take the smallest value of beta that you have when you design it. And then, of course, you can divide the volt, design the voltage divider, because you can then calculate VE1 would be approximately equal to RE1 times 1 milliamp. The reason it's approximate, because 1 milliamp is approximate. Okay, And then, of course, 
V B will be equal to 0.7 plus V E 1. This was something you did last week and the week before. And so you can get the value of V B. And that's essentially the voltage divider. This is approximately equal to R B 2 over R B 1 plus R B 2. times 10 volts. So that equation, together with the much less than condition, should allow you to choose RB1 and RB2. But there's another wrinkle. We want the R in to be greater than 10K. Now it just so happens, and we, I'm not going to prove it, but if you look at the input resistance of this amplifier stage, R in is equal to RB1 parallel RB2. That you can see very easily because if I do the Thevenin equivalent equivalent of this circuit looking in from here, RB1 and RB2 will be in parallel because this is connected to ground, this is connected to ground, they come out in parallel. So the source C is a parallel impedance. That's easy. But in parallel with this will be R pi plus 1 plus beta R E1. So this is the input resistance that you see. And if you have designed this circuit properly, 1 plus beta Re, <coughs> the, uh, the condition of Ib being relatively small actually will give you, you'll see, 1 plus beta Re be, being much bigger than Rb1 parallel Rb2. So you can, even as a first approximation, say that Rb1 parallel Rb2 is the input resistance. And make that bigger than 10K. So that's another condition that you have to check. And this has to be bigger than 10K. See? You don't have to worry about R pi because 1 plus beta Re will be bigger than R pi, so you can f ignore that. And you will even find with the numbers you have chosen, most likely 1 plus beta Re will be much bigger than Rb1 parallel Rb2. And if you have a much bigger resistance in parallel with another resistance, you can ignore the much bigger one. Okay? For example, if I have 1K in parallel with infinity, then it's basically 1K. So if I have 1K in parallel with 1000K, this is approximately the same as 1K. Because when the current splits between the two branches, so much more current will go through the 1K branch because the 1000K branch is a high impedance branch. Why should the current bother, bother to go there? So most of the current will go through the 1K branch. So the parallel combination of a small resistance and a very big resistance is essentially the small resistance. Okay? So you will find that that essentially RB1 parallel RB2 is your input resistance. And that gives you the value of RB1 and RB2. And then that designs the whole circuit. Just one twist in the next part of the experiment. You are required to bypass this resistor here with us. RE1 will be split into two parts. You'll bypass one with a capacitor. What do you think will that do? Let's call it as RE1 and RE2. The net uh, difference sum is the same as you had before, but you have split part of it out like this. What do you think that will do? Will it increase the gain? Remember, what's the gain of this circuit, RC over RE? Does it increase the gain or decrease the gain when I do that? What's the value of RE? Does, it does the emitter resistance for a small signal, does it increase or decrease? What does the capacitor do? OK, if, so if it short circuits a portion of the resistance, OK, it would, uh, if you short circuit a portion of the resistance, it would, um, it would decrease the value of RE, and therefore RC over RE being the gain, it would increase the gain. Okay. So in fact, if you wanted a gain control, you're building a radio and you want to change the volume, volume control. You can just put this as a potentiometer and do that. And as you move this up and down, you'll get a different volume because you're changing the gain. Right? Simple as that. I don't want to change the, uh, I don't want to actually have a potentiometer because if I put a real potentiometer without the capacitor, I'll also change the bias point. I don't want to touch the bias point. It's been carefully biased so that. This is in the active region. If I start really changing the entire value of that resistance, my bias point will change. I don't want to do that. I've taken care to bias this in the active region. I want it to be there. But as far as the voltage gain is concerned, I, I can play around with it. Well, of course, one of the disadvantages of doing that, if I bypass part of the resistance, 
while I am also increasing the or decreasing the value of RE and therefore decreasing the input resistance. So that's the disadvantage of doing that. <coughs> so your source will see a smaller input resistance because that component, the very last component, is being made smaller. I think I'm going to stop here. Are there any questions? <coughs>